I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. My guest today is Whitney Kimball Coe. She's Director of National Programs at the Center for Rural Strategies. Thank you so much for joining me today, Whitney. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Whitney, can you tell our viewers and listeners about the conference that you've been organizing this fall? Oh, I'd love to. Um, We're kicking it off today, in fact. Uh, It's called the Rural Women Everywhere Conference. Um, It's a virtual event because, you know, we're still living in virtual times. Um, And it is, uh, it's an invitation for rural leaders from across the country and our allies to come together and celebrate the role that women play in community, community flourishing across the country. Um, So we're expecting over 800 participants uh, to tune in today. We've got um, some wonderful speakers who will be talking about everything from democracy to how do we build more inclusive communities. Um, We also are welcoming um, some folks from the Biden administration tomorrow. Um, So again, this is a a free conference. You just go to ruralassembly.org to tune in today from 2 to 7 p.m. Eastern. And if this is being recorded, they can likely check that Absolutely. out and the, it won't just be live streamed. So if you're viewing this now, um, visit that same web link. Whitney, are you joining me today from your hometown where I believe you still live, Athens, Tennessee? I am. Uh, I'm, I'm downtown in Athens. Athens, Tennessee is in East Tennessee. It's between Knoxville and Chattanooga, I'm about an hour's equidistance from both. Um, and there, we have a population of about 15,000 people. And I was born and raised here, went away for a little while, and then worked really hard to get back. So let me ask you, is in your mind, is Athens emblematic of any set of rural communities, either in Tennessee, in the Midwest, in the South? Um, I, I'm not attempting to simplify things or uh, cast some kind of homogeneous net here. But it is interesting to take stock of what is rural America today. Mm -hmm. That's a, I mean, what is rural is a really great question and people ask it all the time. And is there just a single definition um, or something we can point to that tells us what rural is? You know, Athens is, I would say it is emblematic of a lot of rural places across the country. It has, you know, more amenities than some places and fewer amenities than others. We do have pretty good broadband access here in Athens, although there's still um, families that that don't because of cost barriers or because they live um, far enough away that, you know, closing the loop is difficult. Um, We do still have a hospital that's up and running, though it's been overrun, of course, with COVID um, cases. Um, We do have a number of really important anchor institutions like a lot of other rural communities. For us, it's it's institutions like the YMCA or the public library. We do have a school system and a baseball field. so there, and those, those institutions I named in churches, of course, um, and a main street. And those, those institutions and, and these markers are where we make meaning of our lives together. And I would say that that's probably the case for a lot of communities across the country, but you make a good point that often rural is, um, is told, or the story of rural is told as a monolith, that it is a, um, a place of, farmers or mostly white conservative voters or um, a per- perhaps a place of despair or someplace that is um, losing a whole lot of population and people are moving away. And those, you know, there, there are kernels of truth in all of those kinds of stereotypes. And yet that is not the whole complex picture of, of any one place. Um, something we do a lot at Rural Strategies, the organization I work for, is try to tell a more nuanced story um, and and also point to the fact that rural people and places are incredibly diverse across history, experience, background, cultures. I expect today that the 800 people or so who are going to turn up for rural women everywhere are coming not only from, you know, rural Appalachia, but they're coming from the Delta, from uh, Native American reservations out west or um, uh, in the south or coming from the Pacific Northwest. There are just so many different kinds of communities, but a lot of the things that um, that bind us together in a rural kind of identity is this notion of how we make meaning together, um, even in times where we're, we're feeling stretched thin. Regionally, if you want to speak to it that way, or just characteristically, what might surprise folks 
who don't spend time in rural America today uh, when it when it comes to that that question of mm -hmm. uh, nuance and that that the realities in these places is uh, far more nuanced than uh, is often simplified or, or portrayed in mainstream media. I think that's a, um, I, I appreciate that question because it's something that we need to be asking ourselves about any community, no matter the zip code, no matter the population. What is this, what's, what's a truer, more human story about what's going on in these relationships in these places? And, you know, the notions we have of rural, mostly from mainstream media and from, uh, you know, um, Hollywood portrayals of rural offer up this kind of antiquated version of rural as either someplace that's very pastoral and you know you think of like cows and a silo or you think of you know the farmers in the field um, maybe you think of a main street where everybody knows um, your name or maybe you think of the opposite end of the spectrum which is you know a, a place that is falling apart or is um is despairing or is uh, full of poverty and, um, and all kinds of challenges that are insurmountable. So those two narratives are often the stereotypes that rural gets plugged into. And oftentimes those uh, narratives are used in news articles or in Hollywood productions. Um, and then we just cast people in the roles that fit one of those narratives. Right. But I think the rural America of today, the rural and native American communities of today um, are, are much more familiar to us than we realize. You know, only 2% of the nation's population actually makes a sustainable living farming anymore. The you know, number one job in rural places is, is like everywhere else in the sense that it's you know, service oriented or it's in the healthcare system or it's in education. Um, you know, we might still know one another's names on Main Street, uh, but the relationships that we share um, are, are just as complex as any other relationship you might have. The other thing I think that's important to note is, you know, as this country is going through a reckoning around racial justice and dismantling systemic racism, um, rural is not exempt from that. And it's not, this, this stereotype of rural is all white is not helpful in when we think about how do we bring rural into national conversations about how we dismantle um, racism uh, because rural is full of uh, some really diverse populations. Um, every, everyone from immigrants to, uh, to African-American populations in the South to, um, to Native Americans, I think uh, there's just deeper conversations to be had. And if we exclude rural from those conversations, then we're doing the whole country a disservice. Let me ask you this, um, Whitney. Are you familiar at all with the work of Kathy Kramer at the University of Wisconsin. Yeah, I admire her a lot. Yeah, I admire, <laughs> I admire Kathy a lot in her book. So, right, I, now we have not hosted Kathy since 2016. In fact, um, it was a premonition um, in my own experience traveling uh, on, a, on a ride from South Bend, um, I guess at the time it was from Dayton to South Bend and um, what she then expressed, even though we were talking about Ohio and Indiana that I was observing in 2016, what she uh, described in her anecdotal evidence of um, rural communities seemed to, to um, be represented in, in my own experiences traveling around the Rust Belt. Um, so I haven't had a chance to, to catch up with Kathy, but our loyal viewers know she talks about the culture and resentments, but I like to add to that aspirations and resentments of rural communities. Uh, because again, you, you can't castigate or narrow cast it in the way of only resentments. But her work, if we're being intellectually honest, is about the resentments of rural communities in Wisconsin and the backlash uh, against state initiatives in Madison, in the capital. You know, based on all the research and advocacy and organizing that you've done since 2016, um, how, how do you think about Kathy's work on the character and consciousness of rural communities right now? That was such an important year, 2016, and her book came out 
the politics of resentment around that time, I remember, and how important it felt to have uh, articulated some of the the story that we were seeing play out um, on, in the national setting and national politics. What I've come to understand more deeply because she opened the door in a way for us to talk more honestly about these things. But what I've come to understand in the last few years is that that resentment that she mentions, I believe it's grounded in a kind of grief and a kind of, um, and a kind of worry and sadness that rural people and places often feel for themselves, for their children, for their communities. When one in four kids in rural is living in poverty and it's higher for kids of color, you know, one in three really, um, living in poverty and with food scarcity. When you know that they're, you know, the nearest hospital is three hours away. And if you have uh, a heart attack or, you know, something that needs immediate assist if you need immediate assistance and you can't get there when you know that your kids can't access broadband to do their homework to participate in democracy in the way that the rest of the country does when you know that your roads are in need of uh, repair and when you know that you are not invited into conversations um, of national import because you've been stereotyped that I mean you could call that resentment or you could consider that maybe that is some kind of grief and sadness and it's and it manifests itself um, in various ways but it's grounded in something that is true and that is that rural people and places have been left behind um, in a number of um, policy arenas uh, so um, that's, isn't that's it kind also, of how I'm thinking about right now right right isn't it also true and, and this is not something I had a chance when she was on the program to ask Kathy about, but isn't it also true that that is a common link between urban and rural when we talk about the crisis of this pandemic, um, but even prior to the pandemic, the food deserts, the medical deserts, uh, you know, th that is a common link. And yet Kathy's work suggested the unwillingness to embrace the, that common link, at least on the part of rural communities. Now that may be true on the part of urban communities too, but, but where are we today looking towards you know, 2022 um, when it comes to evaluating or reevaluating that common link, that there are zip codes in rural communities and urban communities that actually are most parallel in terms of the experience of the constituents and the lacking of the hospital or the food services, um, how do how do you assess that common bond right now? There are you're right. There are certainly parallels. I think um, between rural and sometimes more inner city areas. But what we know is that you know this country is moving towards. A kind of urban existence where population density and capital uh, coalesce, uh, where we are investing in in all kinds of innovation hubs and um, and in some ways ivory towers, uh, and we're leaving we're still leaving rural people and places out of those. In fact, we're suggesting that they should just get a bus ticket and move in um, for those opportunities. Right. So I think where we are now. I'm feeling a little more hopeful these days, even though, you know, I know we've been through two years of pandemic, we've lost so many people. It's been a really challenging time for rural places. A lot of the um, the issues that I've mentioned, including, you know, maternal health care, um, uh, education and infrastructure, all of those things have the, the issues that we know existed before exist even more so now thanks to the pandemic or because of the pandemic. And yet, on the other side, this, these two years later, this I feel like this administration in particular, the Biden administration has worked very hard to include rural perspectives in the policy recommendations they're making and some of these packages they're pushing through Congress. Those dollars that came through the CARES Act have made it directly into the pockets of individual families in rural places um, and it just seems like there is now a spotlight on the fact that we, we exist, there's a heartbeat here and there are 
um, families and, um, and organizations and people with a lot of really great ideas who just need uh, a little bit of that spotlight um, shown on them. I would argue that that exclusion also includes, when you talk about the exclusion from the ivory tower, uh, people who do live in, in close proximity to that tower, just in neighboring zip codes in which that tower doesn't occupy. But I hear you, that there is a specific kind of exclusion. Um, and part of that is cultural uh, and undeniably cultural. And some of that is related to political values and how they've evolved. You know, th there has been a metamorphosis of those values in rural communities, a rural community in Nebraska uh, or where you are in Tennessee, uh, might think very differently about a political struggle or challenge today than they would have two decades ago or a, a half century ago. So how do you help us understand that, uh, the metamorphosis of rural belief or conviction um, and, and how much that is tied to Trumpism, how much that is tied to um, globalization and um, you know, perception of both um, the kind of uh, monopolization of power within in the city, but also uh, within the world broadly. You know, I think a lot of the work that we do at my organization, Rural Strategies, is about telling stories, telling real human stories about, you know, the experiences that people are having uh, on the ground and in, in community. And just as you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, in Appalachia, uh, coal mining is is on its way out and yet people still feel their identity is very much tied to the coal mining lifestyle the coal mining identity that was um, seeded so long ago and the notion of it of of it being pulled away and those workers being asked to I don't know become coders all of a sudden or right. you know pick up a whole other uh, set of tools and identities nobody, nobody uh, appreciates um, that, that sort of narrative. So understanding and listening to people about what they value um, is more than just, it's more than just about, you know, the, the political gamesmanship that we have at the moment. It's more than about, you know, those hard right issues or Trumpism or, um, uh, you know, our, our, our deep seated political divide. It's so much um, denser and and, um, and more nuanced than that. I mean, we we have to decide, you know, are we going to write off rural as Trump country or are we going well, you you know, to talk that. about it I as, mean, right, or are we going to talk about right. it as our, as grandma's cornbread? Are we going right. to talk about it right. in terms of um, organizations that are failing or populations that are walking away? Or are we going to define it as civic organizations yeah. like public libraries and schools? Um, so these are human lives that are being led every day in relationship yeah. with one another and with communities, with their communities. And I think the, the conversation has to revolve around that more than, um, more than those other pieces. No, I hear you, I hear you. Um, and I appreciate your human and humane focus, I do. Um, my question really is focusing on understanding how much of that personal is really animating people's views? And I go back to the idea of resentments and aspirations. I kind of came up with that as a play on the whole Ethan Hawke from Training Day, the movie Smiles and Cries, right? He talks about how he sees the streets. Uh, and he, he is actually intoxicated when he says this, after, but you know, it, was, it was helping him define very concisely the streets. And it's not just the streets, it's any zip code in America. There are people smiling, there are people crying. It sounds, um, you know, rather simplistic, but in fact, you know, people are consulting their innermost values and emotions in considering personal dilemmas. But I'm just trying to understand how much of the public policy is caught up in their evaluation. Because as I've often said here on The Open Mind and when I'm out and about in the country, now I think what is most germane is the origin of people's convictions, how they arrive at their final decision or summation of an issue. And when that is driven by listening 
and listening to personal anecdotes and experiences, that's, that's ideal from the perspective of, of the listener. But it's not always driven by story. Sometimes it's driven by something other than story. Sometimes it's driven by policy or um, a, a disconnect between uh, real life and you know, how something is interpreted um, that veers from you know, actually the facts and getting mm -hmm. at whether it is facts and or emotions that are driving those human reactions, I think is important. But I connect that to uh, Laura Kelly in Kansas being elected governor in response to uh, the previous governor's decimation of public education. And I, when I asked the question, I was really asking if you had any particular insight into that question of where the personal intersects with the policy and, and um, to the extent that some of those policy convictions have evolved in these last decades. But, but there are places like Kansas and Kentucky that have voted for, for Democratic governors, even though they've largely followed what they, what they say are the policies of, of Trumpism. So I just wonder how you see that, that tension. I mean, I don't know. I have so many thoughts um, about, about this conversation. And they, sometimes they change by the day when I'm you know, reading another article or, or, or discerning myself um, how much of my own convictions are based on emotion and values and heritage you know, versus the facts of the matter right in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to be honest about that. But also, you know, when I think about even my own town, our, our newspaper has now gone down to two days a week delivery. We have uh, a, a, a daily fax that comes out that is mostly rip and read news from national, from the national level. Mm -hmm. um, we have a radio program that is mostly funded or in, uh, created by kind of far right uh, folks. So, you know, a lot of this, I think, has to do with the information we're receiving. And if we believe that perception drives policy, then, you know, what are the tools and what are the access points that we have to shape our own perceptions? And, you know, this cycle of disinformation is really troublesome and the closing of um, kind of these democratic stronghold newspapers. It's really troublesome. Um, you know, so we're all, in a way we're all flailing about trying to make sense of all the things, right? The, the facts of the policy, our emotional response, where we seed our identity. And also the fact that it, for us, for those of us living in rural, we know that's um, you know, most of the country was rural until 1912. So I think all of us have, even those people living in urban America, have these roots. We all have to share these same similar roots um, in what was a rural society. So it's not something that's easily set at the wayside, you know. Um, so those are some, some of my jumbled thoughts um, about how this plays out. But I keep coming back to if rural equity is the is the goal of the, my organization, which it is, and it and it sh I would hope it be the goal more broadly, then I think rural equity looks a whole lot like inclusion and imagination and um, an ability to see the human um, and champion our, our one another's experiences. We, if we don't champion one another's experiences, uh, then we can't truly understand where we're all coming from. Do you see though? the paradigm of Thomas Frank's work still applying in some instances of, you know, what's the matter with people who are voting? And I don't mean to say this pejoratively, but what's, what's the matter with anybody in urban America, rural America, suburban America voting against their interests? And we're almost out of time, but you rightly point out that it was a mistake of politicians to suggest that coal miners were going to uh, just become coders overnight. Um, that was a mistake. Uh, morally, it was demoralizing to a whole generation of, of tried and true uh, American workers, um, West Virginians. But in the case of, of West Virginia, uh, uh, which seems to have a higher profile than Tennessee or Kentucky now because of Joe Manchin's role in the United States Senate, 
Um, I, I, I just wonder how much of that phenomenon continues to be true of um, the kind of oligarchic class purporting to represent uh, middle America, although again, let's not say represent rural communities and yet denying those same communities franchise or opportunity in the policies that they're supporting. Is that still yeah, that, a problem? That whole, the, well. Politicians denying the problems in their own community. Uh, sure. It's, I mean, it's a problem across all zip codes and, you know, the conundrum of voting your interests. It's not, it, in a way, it's not very helpful because even, you know, Democrats voting for certain agendas, it may not necessarily benefit their pocketbook. Um, so I, you know, when I think about even my own state, the, those folks in power, the preservation of power becomes the, the most important thing beyond um, public policy, beyond the common good, beyond um, coming into some self-awareness about how we're all linked. Um, so I think what we're up against now, and this is not just a rural phenomenon, is kind of the dismantling of this notion of preserving power for, um, for power's sake, as opposed right. to, um, yeah, as opposed to, to supporting the flourishing of communities. That doesn't answer all Whitney, the questions. I know you have to run. Lot. To, to manage this amazing Rural Assembly Conference of uh, Rural Women Leaders. I urge our viewers to check out Whitney's work connected with the Center for Rural Strategies and Rural Assembly. Whitney Kimball Co., thank you so much for your time today. So good to talk to you. Thank you. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.